Welcome everybody to our Sound for Video session. Today's the 18th of October, 2020. Really glad to have everybody join us here. Uh, we are going to cover a couple of things. Let me just go ahead and switch over here to the agenda so that we can take a look at what we've got for today. Um, first up, for those that are working with the Sound Devices 8 series, we do have a new firmware update and the main changes there, there were some compatibility. It now supports a WYSIWYGOM, uh, one of the receivers, I believe it's the the quad channel receiver and then also um, there's some changes to where you can save um, your take so when it goes past midnight you know a lot of times it will move forward to a new day just a little change there where you can choose to keep it in the same as the previous day so if you're working overnight um, <laughs> you can keep everything organized the appropriate way all right um, let's go ahead and take a look so I, I want to give you a little background before we show I, I shot a little piece last night kind of giving a tour of my sound cart that we're going to air here in just a second but before we get to that i want to give a little bit of context to that because this sound cart that i'm using is not probably it's not typical in a, in a lot of ways if you go to a production set for a larger budget film this is not the kind of cart you're going to see <laughs> uh, i'm coming again from mainly a corporate video standpoint I'm almost always operating solo as a, I, I am the sound department when I'm doing my corporate video. A lot of times I'm also the camera operator. A lot of times the director, do the sound, do the lighting, um, do pretty much everything. So this card is really kind of set up for those circumstances. Now, every once in a while, I also hire myself out as a location sound mixer. Again, in those cases, I am usually the only person in the sound department. So this is all within that context, just so you're aware. So things would be set up very differently if you were doing a um you know if you had a department with three people in it a boom operator a utility and the mixer um, in those cases typically those sound carts are also going to have video monitoring on them they're going to have um, much more uh, they're going to have comm systems that are built out typically i didn't actually run through any of that so um yeah, anyway, this is really high level. Let's take a look at that and then we'll come back and talk about it a little bit more. All right, let's take a look at the cart here today. So this is a work in progress, first of all. So it's uh, it's not done yet and I've been working on it for a while. Obviously, I haven't had a chance to use it a whole lot during the pandemic. So there are uh, a number of things that I haven't filled out or fleshed out yet. Um, but let me give you kind of the idea of what I'm aiming for here. Let me actually going to start at the bottom. So there's a kind of a shelf down here at the bottom and you can see here there's a big battery. This is a DNO, um, I think they call it like a super generator or something, but it's a 900 watt hour battery. And I put it down on the bottom, of course, it's fairly heavy. So <laughs> it acts as ballast really. And it doesn't fit kind of lying flat down the way I have things configured here. And it also kind of makes sense to have it facing up here because here are the outputs here to run the power up into the bag. So that's the first thing down there. We do have a shelf down here. There's a cup holder here just to have a, a water bottle down there to keep myself hydrated. Um, so that's the bottom shelf. Obviously, I still have a couple of, you can't really, I don't know if you can see how you can see them here, bungee cords. Um, that's for kind of battening things down when I am moving around. So um, that's the idea there. Over on this side, we have our script holder. It's on a little friction arm, so you can move it around to fit wherever you need it to fit. And likewise, we have an iPad over here running SD remote. So that, that gives me kind of a, a large surface to work with if I do need to make adjustments here. On the newest version here with the latest firmware, we also have the ability to adjust the faders right on the SD remote app. So that's nice as well. Uh, next up, I actually have a... I, uh, tray that slides out. Uh, ideally, this would be for a control surface or a mixing surface. I don't have anything along those lines yet. And I guess I should give you a little more context before we jump any more into this. L let me get a explain how I use a cart. <laughs> Up until now, I've been a bag mixer. That is to say, I've always had my mixer in a bag and um, I've had a harness, a shoulder harness that I wear and live with the bag all day long around me, carrying it with my weight, or carrying it its weight with me, <laughs> my back. And um, I do have some back issues from time to time, so there are a lot of jobs I work where, with a very small cart like this, I can roll this right up to the edge of set and put it in a position where it's not getting in the way of anything else, and I can just boom myself. So 
Um, I'm not actively mixing in most of my jobs. I'm, I'm really just kind of capturing the ISOs. And um, so this works out pretty nicely for that purpose. Um, so at some point, maybe we'll put something on the sliding shelf. Uh, again, until I get more mileage with this whole setup here, it'll I think it'll become obvious a little bit more quickly <laughs> once I'm able to do some jobs and kind of figure out where I want to put things and uh, where they need to go. Uh, obviously, there's a hook over here for the headphones, which is nice just to have a place to put that when I'm uh, in between shots or, you know, whatever's happening. On this side, uh, I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of concealed back here, but there is a little mechanism here for uh, holding a boom, boom pole. So we have a little receiver of cup down here at the bottom and then uh, a latch up here at the top that allows me to secure that in. So when I'm rolling around or in between takes, I can put it there. Now, part of the issue I have is that I have a side exit and a rear exit boom pole. So putting it in there between takes isn't really feasible, but when I am moving around and I've disconnected, uh, that's an option there. So may actually eventually at some point look at some of the ambient poles um, where that would be a little bit more feasible, I think. Okay, up here next at the bag, uh, and, and I should say the bag is attached on the rear with some bungee cords. So there's some hooks on the bag up here and here, and those are attached to the frame of the overall cart back here. Oh, I should say also, this is a sound cart mini cart. Uh, the name of the company is sound cart. The model is mini cart. They actually have a, I think they're working on a newer version right now or just released a newer version as well. Um, but anyway, this is a, it's a, it's pretty nice. And let me just kind of spin it around here really quick before we get up to the bag itself. Just so you can see the back. You can see there's a system here. I do have, I don't have it on right now, but there is a, a rack you can potentially connect up here, a rack adapter. So if you have some rack mounted gear, you can put that back here. Um, but you can see how we have the bungee cords attached right now. And there are a variety of different accessories and shelves that you can hook to the, the back right here. Here we have uh, a mast for an antenna. So when I get my shark fin antennas, um, we have that's the start of that. We'll actually have this on this, this side as well. Right now, what I have here is just um, a hanger for extra cables. So I can attach some cables here if I need to do that. All right, back to the front. All right, now back up to the bag. So uh, the, the kind of the core of the bag here is a Sound Devices 888. And this is a, a mixer that is probably more than I'm ever going to need. Probably, um, but it comes in, in handy in a lot of situations. And I'm actually, I kind of went back and forth between this and the 833 when I first bought this, but I'm actually glad I went with this with its Dante capabilities. Now that the pandemic is here, um, I think that's gonna come in handy with my corporate work where I'll be able to set up uh, on the set with a little box. Here I have, for example, let's pull this out here. Here's a little Dante box here. Um, two inputs, Ethernet here, and I can get this set up in the actual set and then run that via Ethernet to the 888 and control the 888 and mix remotely. So in the end, I'm pretty happy that I made this decision. It worked out well for me, even though in terms of I.O. or inputs and outputs, it's probably more than I need in most circumstances, but um, it's, it's working really well. Next up, we have the SL2 slot system up here. This holds two wireless receivers. These are both audio limited A10s receivers. Right now, I'm just using the one channel here and I've powered down this one. So obviously the idea is you can power down uh, by slot and then also for each of the dual channel receivers. These are each dual channel. So this is four channels here. Oops. Um, what you can do is you can power just one side if you need to, like in this circumstance where I just have one lavalier mic. So, uh, there's that. And then here, battery distribution. So this power from the 900 watt hour battery runs up into my PSC triple play battery distribution system. So this has three power inputs. And in fact, I used to use the, um, what was it? It's over here. When I was working with my uh, 633, I was using the remote audio BDS V4. Um, but the nice thing about the triple play is it has three power inputs. 
And so right now I have power coming in from the big 900 watt hour battery plus each of these two smart batteries. Sometimes they're known as high Q batteries. Um, so I have little battery sleds down here attached to each of these. They each run into here. The nice thing about this is that I can actually disconnect or change batteries without powering down the wireless. So the mixer itself has a couple of Sony L series batteries on the back, so it can always be powered even when I'm switching the external batteries. But the wireless relies on this. And so because I have three different power inputs, I have these two smart batteries plus the big battery down here, um, I don't have any problems. Um, one of the things I can do as well is with this, I also have the AC adapter. So if I am near AC, I can pull out one of these battery inputs, plug in an AC adapter, and I can power for as long as we have AC power. So that's a pretty nice setup there for us. Uh, what's nice about this setup too is that it is still in a bag. So if I do find myself in a situation where the cart's not going to do the job and I need to be more mobile, I can just remove the bungee cables here and I can be operating my bag pretty quickly. I have to disconnect the big battery, of course. Um, disconnect these two bungee cables here. And then I think I'm pretty much ready to go. Make sure I, you know, whatever I have running into the bag, if for my boom or whatever, plus the headphones, put those on and I'm good to go. So that's a quick look at this. I think what we're going to do in a future episode is we'll come back and probably look a little bit more closely to the SL2, the slot system here. The nice thing about this is that you can actually put in receivers that can take up to four channels per slot. So you could actually have eight channels here. Um, the SL2 also has some digital AES inputs on the back so I can get four more inputs that way. So now with my 888, I can, let's see, I believe I have one AES input here that does two channels on the mixer itself plus two additional, so I can get six channels of AES digital into the mixer here. I don't work a lot with AES digital, to be honest, mostly on the outputs, actually. If I've got a camera and I need to run you know, hardwired to a camera with an AES input, that's most, mostly where I use it, and that works pretty nicely. Um, so Another thing that's nice about the SL2 system that we'll kind of explore in a little bit more detail as I get more experience with it you can see here I'm just using the whip antennas right now. Um, but you can do some filtering on this as well. And you can work with smart antennas as well. So we'll talk about what all that means, again, as I get a little bit more experience with it myself and kind of dive into it a bit more. So there's a tour of my current sound card. Obviously, it's going to morph over time as I get more experience with it and actually use it on more jobs. I've used it on one job so far, right before the pandemic started in late February. And um, hopefully we'll be to a point where we can start putting it to use here pretty soon. So there is a look <laughs> at my uh, cart setup so far. Um, again, work in progress, a lot of things that may change over time. There were a couple of questions that came up during that. I wanna kinda just go back and take a look at those real quick here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, first up from Rob here, we have, uh, do you think you'll take this cart to most jobs even if they could be done in a bag? Yeah, that's the that's the plan. <laughs> even for the corporate pieces where I'm doing everything, it just makes it a little easier to, to get everything where I need it. Um, a lot of times for that corporate work, I'm in an office setting. Um, I'm, I'm loading everything in and out myself. So I've got a, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. I think Alejandro had a question earlier uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit later today. Um, I have a cart called a rock and roller, which I use to schlep in most of the camera gear and the lighting gear. And then having the audio gear on a separate cart is, is really useful. So yeah, I'll probably take it to most most jobs. It'll make it a little easier to get around. Just because just again, I usually have to set up and then... I'll shoot something in one conference room and then have to go to another conference room just because of scheduling. And so moving everything around becomes, it's, logistically it becomes pretty complex. And so having the additional cart makes it a little easier for that. So, all right. From Lloyd, for your corporate work, do you use cables for camera? Yeah, definitely when I'm, when I'm running, um, when I do have to send sound to camera, uh, I'll definitely do it with um, cables as opposed to wireless. It just makes things, you know, usually again, it's mostly me operating in those circumstances. When I have uh, the narrative jobs, when I'm doing freelance work, 
we typically don't run audio to camera. In that case, we're using time code. So um, that makes things you know a little easier from that standpoint. So I'll do the jam uh, up front and get everything hooked up and, and running that way. But then we typically will not run audio to camera in those circumstances. All right, how many hours are you getting off the smart batteries and what is powering what? Okay, so Alejandro, great, good question. So the smart batteries go into the PSC battery distribution system and then outputs are going to the sound devices 888 and um, by extension to the SL2. Um, so actually, now that I think about it <laughs> and I haven't used the SL2 on a job yet, that's brand new for me. Um, I just realized that I actually don't technically need um, when I'm changing batteries, uh, the, the NPF batteries on the back of the S sound devices 888 would continue powering the wireless as well. So <laughs> that's another way to solve that same problem. But yeah, it's, it's all, it's, it's powering basically everything. So I also have a USB output on that power distribution system. So if I need to power anything via USB, so for example, if I need to charge up that iPad, we can do that. Or if my phone needs charging, I can do that. Um, so it powers pretty much everything. Also, at some point, if I do end up adding um, any sort of rack mount wireless gear or rack mount uh, video monitors, it would power, well, the video monitors probably not. That would be a separate thing. But it might actually be the same battery, that big battery down on the bottom. So that, that's to be determined. I, I don't have any plans for that currently. I'm not sure how people usually power those, but um, that would probably be a separate it probably would not be through the battery distribution system. So that's that's kind of the high level there. Um, can you use the SL2s for the MCR54 quad receivers from WYSICOM? My understanding is yes, you can. So that means you can get a total of eight channels of wireless on the SL2, which is pretty nice for its size. Definitely a nice, uh, nice way to work. Keep things nice and small. Uh, what additional gear will you add to the cart? So for right now, one of the plans is to add in a uh, second mast. So I'll have two masts with the shark fin antennas on there. Um, so that'll give me a little bit more uh, flexibility in terms of where the cart's located relative to the wireless packs. So I'll get a little bit more range there. Um, not that I've necessarily had any major issues now, but I, um, I have had cutouts a little bit on the A10 systems, but it was usually in between um kind of between takes it was it was when the, you know the actor went off to the to go do something to the craft table or something and i lost signal which obviously doesn't matter in those circumstances but um there have been a few cases like establishing shots for example is where you tend to get a little bit more range it seems like or where you are required to get more range you have to kind of work a little bit farther away because they're usually really wide shots um, so if they do need you capturing sound from wireless at that point, that's where you definitely need that range. And I think that's where those antennas are going to be most helpful there. I did have one, for example, um, an establishing shot where there was an actor leaning up against a car as another car pulled into the parking lot. And so the, the camera kind of panned as that car pulled in towards the other car with the other actor leaning against the car. Um, when the actor leaned against the car, we did have some dropouts. Now, I don't know... They didn't have any lines of dialogue, so it wasn't an issue in that particular case. But, um, and I don't know if a shark fin would help in that case. We were probably 40 or 50 meters away, is my guess. But I think it had more to do with them kind of the antenna touching against the metal on the car, is my guess. I don't really know 100% what happened there. Um, but in any case, when, when you do have those establishing shots, that's for me where it's probably going to be most useful. All right. Um, can you hang your nice Eddie Bauer jackets on it? <laughs> uh, well, actually, one thing I didn't talk about in the video, you, you could, there's some, there's a kind of an extension that comes up with a couple of wheels on the back. You could use one of those as a coat hook, I imagine. Um, but that's actually another feature that I didn't really cover. When you do need to lie it down, like, for example, when I'm transporting it, I'll usually take it in a small SUV. Um, and so what's nice about it is you can actually lie it down on its back. So it has the big wheels at the bottom plus the smaller wheels at the top, which gives you, makes it a little easier to kind of get it in and out of places. And also if for whatever reason on the set, you need to kind of lie it down, lay it down and, and move it along. You've got those four wheels, which is a pretty nice kind of situation there. Um, just back up to Lloyd's uh, comment there on the BDS system, the, the triple play, the BDS system from, 
PSC, the triple play, is I wish I had bought that one first. Um, a lot of people use the remote audio, and it's pretty good. But having those three inputs is really, really nice. So you can also, a thing that's really nice about it too is that if I do have AC power, being able to plug in uh, without pulling all the other batteries out necessarily, and also when I'm powering the Sound Devices 888, it's charging those Sony L-series batteries on the back. So um, overall, that's been, yeah, that was a really good investment, I think. <laughs> all right, let's see here. Question, have you ever used Roland equipment? Yes, in fact, my very first uh, audio interface, my USB audio interface was, and I think it was actually branded Ederall by Roland, and I think there was a merger of a couple of companies there, but it was a really great USB audio interface. It was the very first one I owned. I don't know the model number. They don't make it anymore, as far as I'm aware, but um, it was really good. It did a, the preamps in it were really high quality, so I've actually been pretty impressed with some of Roland's equipment. I haven't used anything beyond that, but I think they do make some good stuff. All right, from Ken, I would recommend a single mast with a crossbar for your antennas and then a remote antenna mast for maximum antenna diversity. Are you still using Comtex? Yeah, so good. I appreciate that, Ken. I appreciate the input there. I am still using Comtex when I need them. <clears throat> um, I just have a single transmitter. I think they're the 216s, if I'm not mistaken on the model number. So just a transmitter and then two receivers. And again, up until this point, I've all done, I've done all of that from a bag, with, just with a single um, antenna on the that comes with the transmitter itself. So nothing too fancy there. Um, but I appreciate the input there. That's a good idea. So a single mast um, with a little bit of a remote um, with a remote antenna mast. Okay. So in other words, being able to get a little more distance between them, I think, is what you're saying. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Ken. Did we get this one already here? When you're doing corporate work, are you just doing audio or camera as well? A lot of times with the corporate work, I'm doing both. Um, and not only that, but I'm also doing lighting. I'm also directing. I try to get out of, I try to not get out of the directing. I try to um, recruit someone else to do the directing in those cases. So for, sometimes we do what I would call kind of like mini faux narratives we kind of basically set up a scenario for a it's a product demonstration in short built into kind of a little narrative piece and usually what i try to do there's one of my colleagues there tom clausen at work um is very good at directing and so i've had him do the directing um we've also had some other people fill in as director at, at various times as well and um, that just makes the job so much easier when you're wearing that many hats um, you really do need to you need to get some help <laughs> depending on what the you know what the goals are as far as production values so all right let's jump over into our questions for today and we'll come back to the chat here in a little bit first up from alejandro i remember some time ago you mentioned uh having a rock and roller cart i currently have the r12 rt stealth all-terrain it's the black one and i'm wondering what are you using for boom, boom pole holders and if you're like me, what are you using for coffee cup holders? All right, let me pause there. So actually, Alejandro, yeah, great, great question. I do have the rock and roller. I think I have the same one. It's the Stealth. It's all black. Um, it's been really good. That for me, to be honest, is not, well, I'm not using it as a sound card at all. I'm using it entirely as a cart to, to roll in camera and lighting equipment. <clears throat> However, um, there was a, a third party bag and I'll, I'll go look it up and put a link in the description below. There's a bag that attaches to the handles that allows you to put, um, it's really, it's called a grip and gaffer bag, I think, um, but it allows you, I, I actually stuff a bunch of um, C-stands in there, so it makes it a lot easier to, to manage the C-stands. It's a pretty tough bag. I can usually get three C-stands in there, and you put them in uh, head down so that the legs are sticking up, and they're kind of hanging at a weird angle, but you have a um, like a nylon strap to cinch it down and kind of stabilize it. So that's what I've been doing, and um, that's been working pretty well so far. I did also buy the shelf. The shelf was okay quality. It has it was it's it's kind of a pressed um, like an engineered wood kind of thing with a black cover over it, um, kind of a hard plastic material over it, and that's okay. I use that uh, when I'm in here in the studio, like if I just need somewhere to place something for a while, or it can be really handy too for. Um, when you're getting prepped for wireless runs so or 
yeah, for wireless. So I've, I'll put the wireless transmitters in. It'll just give me a work surface. That's one of the like practical things that you learn really quickly <laughs> when you're doing location work is that um, you need surfaces to put things. And so, um, you know, being able to set up the wireless mics, for example, you need space where you can do that. And working on the ground is not ideal. So that's the main thing that I use the rock and roller cart for. So let's see what else he had on that there. I'm also thinking about a rack and shelving unit to store uh, an FRC 8 for now, but with enough space to place something like a CL12 from sound devices later on. Lastly, okay, so let's, let me pause there. Yeah, you could definitely, that the, the, the shelves or the, the kind of desk surface that Rock and Roller has on offer, like I said, it's it's, it's okay. A bunch of people complained that when they got it, it was all banged up and chipped up. Uh, mine came in and it was okay. Um, and it, and it works reasonably well. And yes, you could certainly put a CL16 on there, um, and whatever else you need to. So it's a pretty nice work surface from that standpoint. Um, but I didn't really want to use it as a, I, like for me, it's like an auxiliary unit, or maybe I would call it a follow cart versus my actual sound cart. So, all right. Um, lastly, what brand of C stands are you using to hang sound blankets and setting boom pole holders for sit down interviews? All right. Um, I use the impact most of them are impact C stands. I have a, a series of them. I do have a couple of Kupos as well, K-U-P-O. Um, but impact is the main one I'm using, and those are sold at B and H. They're great. They're solid. They have never failed me. They're super heavy. <laughs> I think they're probably heavier than the Matthews stands, um, but they hold up really, really well. And if you've got a cart to haul them around, I haven't found it to be a problem. When I was having to haul those by hand, yeah, that was a a bit much, but um, with the cart now, it's not a problem. So that's what I'm using. All right, let's head on over to our second or next question. Next up from Chris. After watching the videos in your course on the Mix Pre, which is great, by the way, I started to wonder how you typically rig out a small one person recorder camera setup. For example, is it something like tripod, Mix Pre, quick release plate camera with a magic arm on the tripod to cell phone for the app? Um, yes, let me answer that. So Chris, I have to confess, I don't usually work with rigs like that. So I, I actually own all that equipment, but I don't usually operate that way. So even when I'm doing my corporate work, if I do bring in the Panasonic or one of the other small cameras like the pocket cinema cameras, um, I usually don't have the audio recorder connected to it. Now, if you're doing shoulder work, you know, shoulder rig, um, that kind of thing, or you need to keep everything together, then yeah, the, the setup you described works really nicely. The, the quick release plate, I think, serves two purposes. Number one, a lot of people experience what sound like ground loop issues with that combination, the Mix Pre and the and, uh, Panasonic GH series cameras. So that's one thing that that quick release plate seems to provide enough isolation so you don't get that buzz. Um, and then secondly, you're going to have to swap out camera batteries at some point and taking the whole rig apart, <laughs> which basically you would have to do if you didn't have that quick, re quick release plate between the camera and the Mix Pre. Um, what I mean by that in practical terms, if you don't have that quick release system between the camera and recorder, you have to take the entire rig off the tripod, remove the bottom quick release plate for the tripod, take the camera off of the mix pre, change the battery, reattach it to the mix pre, reattach the uh, quick release plate, and then put it back on your tripod. So it's not a very practical way to work. And so, yes, definitely recommend that you put a quick release system between the camera and the, the mix pre if you're going to do that. Next up, uh, once all the components arrive, my plan setup will be a Mix Pre 6, Sony A7S 3 Ninja 5. With the camera's HDMI port being used for the Ninja connectivity, can I still sync time code between the camera and Mix Pre? Yes, but um, there's, a cons there, there's a, I guess, a caveat there. So what some people try to do is run the camera... HDMI out to the Atomos and then the Atomos HDMI out to the Mix Pre. And I think I just saw one person send me a thing last week or the week before saying they got it to work, but not really. <laughs> they got it to communicate, but what happened was when they pressed record on the camera, it would start recording on the Atomos as well. And it would start recording on the Mix Pre, but then it would immediately turn off the Mix Pre. So here's what I know about that setup. Um, Atomos claims that they pass through all of the HDMI start and stop flags. 
in practice, it doesn't seem to be the case. Something's getting muddled up in there, and I don't know what it is. <clears throat> and it, maybe it depends on the camera, but um, I haven't used a Sony a7S III, so I don't know on that particular camera. But um, the, what it comes down to in the end is that the only solution I've seen that works reliably across cameras for that setup is you have to use an HDMI splitter, and specifically a powered HDMI splitter. So the problem with that is that makes your rig a fair bit bigger <laughs> and you have to find a way to power it. So it's not the ideal situation. So if you're planning to use HDMI time code, then you're going to need to look for a powered HDMI splitter and find a way to power that. If on the other hand, um, you know, you're just going to run HDMI from the camera to the Atomos, um, eesh. I, 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 you're going to have to use time code generators and you're going to have to have one for the camera and one, you know, the MixPre has one built in unless you're using one of the first gen um, MixPre 3 or 6. But um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more complicated once you start trying to do that. So um, just some things to consider. If you have it all on the same rig, I would run audio to the camera as well from the MixPre. Um, yeah, that's my recommendation, just to keep things simple and straightforward. So thanks for the questions, Chris. Appreciate that. Hope that was helpful. All right, from our friend saying, what would be the best way to mic up two to three people? Recently, I recorded talking head type shot with two people in it. I used two lav mics, but notice that they bleed into each other a lot. Would it have been better to use two shotgun mics instead, or is there a good way to record using just one mic? It really depends on the situation. So if you're doing a sit-down interview, for example, um, there are a couple things you can do. Uh, I don't know which mixer. Did you say which mixer you're using? Let's go take a look at that again. Oh, yes, you have. he has a MixPre 3 too. Okay, so in that context, uh, one thing that I would recommend looking at is the um, auto mix feature or mix assist feature, it's called, on the MixPre. It does cost $100 but it will save you a ton of time in post. And the other option is to mix in post. And what I mean by that in particular is that you'll have two different channels for the each for each of the mics. When person A is not talking, I would cut out their audio or at least use a fader to automate their level way down. That way you won't hear the bleed of the second person talking into the, the first person's mic. So, and then you'll have to do, you know, vice versa throughout the entire mix. It's a fair bit of work. It's worth it because it sounds so much better in my mind, but, um, that's one of the challenges when you're, as soon as you have two microphones that are live, that's a consideration. Now, if you have uh, two people and you can actively boom between them and cue the mic between them as they talk, that solves that problem. So that's another option, depending on what you're doing. That's hard to do for really long interviews. So <laughs> um, using two boom microphones, in my experience, doesn't solve that problem. It sounds different, but it doesn't solve that problem. Um, and Mix Assist would be really helpful in those circumstances as well. I think Mix Assist is going to work probably best with two lav mics, to be entirely honest. Um, but there's that as well. Um, and also, T, uh, we have a comment here. Let's go ahead and put that up on the screen here real quick. So <laughs> clapper boards are useful for syncing in post as well. Absolutely agree. So, And in fact, I, I will say this. When I do... Most of my work, unless I'm doing a narrative piece that's going to be a little bit longer, I don't I don't bother with time code. I just use a clapper or a slate, and or just even clap my hands. Just something to make the sync easier. Um, when you get to a point where you are going to come back with a lot of footage and a lot of audio clips, that's when I think time code makes more sense. So, all right. Second question, just got my MixPre 3.2 and I've been playing with it for a few days now. I've been recording mostly with lav mics, but want to get a boom mic. I was originally looking at the NTG5, but recently thought about getting a hypercardioid like the Octava MK012. What would you recommend as a first mic for someone? I really like that. Well, uh, let, let me say a couple things. So, uh, if I could only choose between those two mics, I'd probably choose the Rode NTG5. Um, I will say this. My NTG5 has been great. My Octava has been great. I've heard some complaints from both uh, from people who owned both of those that they've had issues with them, like reliability issues. Um, some people say they're getting a lot of buzz on their NTG5. I don't know what to make of that because I haven't experienced it. 
on my copy. So I sometimes think, um, some of them I think it's a legitimate like hardware issue with those microphones. In some cases, I think it's people not understanding signal to noise <laughs> ratio and understanding that you're still gonna pick up some ambient noise. Um, so I don't really know uh, in that case. But if I were if I could only choose one of those two, I'd probably choose the NTG5 as a really versatile mic to use in a lot of situations. I have nothing against the Octava, um, except that it doesn't sound great with really sibilant voices, whereas I felt like the NTG5 was a little bit more balanced from that standpoint. Okay, so that's my thought on that. Thanks for those questions. All right, next up from Ruslan. Right now my workspace is acoustically unprepared um, and, and English is not Ruslan's first language. He apologized for that in advance. I didn't include that here in the question, but um, we totally understand what you're talking about. My workspace is not acoustically, uh, is acoustically unprepared and I'm using foam sheets to reduce echo. If I replace foam with acoustic blankets, will it give it a better effect? Will the recording quality improve? One blanket in front of me behind the camera and two on the sides. That's a really good question. Now, I'd have to know more about the foam that you're using to tell whether it's going to be better. But if you use sound blankets that are designed for that purpose, not just moving blankets, but actual sound blankets, they're really pretty heavy. Um, so that's the first thing to consider. I, I would think that it would be... The, the advantage of the sound blankets, too, is that a lot of times you can hang them away from the wall a little bit which essentially um, potentially gives some additional benefits so that when the sound, some sound will make it through the sound blanket without getting absorbed. It will bounce off the wall behind it and come back for another pass through the sound blanket. So essentially you're getting two passes through that sound blanket, which is useful. A lot of times with foam that's mounted directly on the, on the wall. And so I don't think you're going to get quite as much. Now, the, the, the downside of both of those, both foam and sound blankets, and foam in particular, depending especially on how thick it is, foam really just attenuates high frequencies. It doesn't do anything below, you know, a lot of times, like especially like the one inch thick foam, it won't really affect anything below like 300 hertz. Um, so if you do have low frequency issues in that particular room building up, for example, um, that's not going to do a whole lot for you. In that case, I think something like a... a, um, a dedicated really heavy sound blanket is going to do better than that so i did some consulting a couple of years ago for some guys that wanted to do a podcast and they were in this room in a um it was a glass enclosed room in a kind of industrial warehouse space um so it's kind of office space in the front of the warehouse and it was a horrible horrible room in terms of uh reverberation and there was actually quite a bit of bass buildup as well so even just talking had this kind of low whoa, 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 whoa kind of sound going on. And what they had done before they called me is they had, they were, you know, gluing up acoustic foam everywhere. And it was just a really thin, like maybe inch thick acoustic foam. And they're like, it's just not helping. What can we do? <laughs> and so what we ended up doing is hanging the sound blankets just a little bit away from the wall, you know, at least a foot away from the wall uh, around them. And that did a much, much better job. So there's some thoughts there for you. All right, part two. What do you think are reasonable positions, bottom and top, for the gain control on the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 recorder for two microphones, the Octava MK012, which appears to be a very popular microphone in today's session, <laughs> and the Sennheiser MKH416 separately for each? Uh, well, for gain, um, I don't usually, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't usually, I don't have burned in my mind what the gain settings would be. It has to, It has a lot to do with how far the mic is from the person that you're recording or whatever the sound source is from what you're recording. It also um, depends on how loud that sound source is, so how loud the voice is. So what I typically do is just adjust the gain until my peaks are hitting between minus 18 and minus 12 on the mix pre, usually, if I'm going to have a post workflow. If I'm doing live, um, I'll go a much hotter than that. I'll probably aim for minus 12 to minus 6, usually. So I would just adjust, don't, don't, don't get too hung up on what the gain setting is or should be in terms of a number. Instead, use the meters and your ears to figure out what sounds good. So that's what I would recommend for you. Hopefully that helps. Uh, I guess I should say, let's go back to that last one really quickly. Just 
just as a kind of a, a starting point, I'm going to guess for most condenser mics like the MK012 and the Sennheiser, um, usually I find condenser mics, if you have them at a, an appropriate distance for voice, typically you're going to have them in the 40-some range, maybe maybe creeping up to 50-some, but usually it's going to be in the, the upper 30s and the, the 40s somewhere, just as a rule of thumb. But I don't have a specific number burned in my head because that's not how I usually set gain. So, all right, next question from Alex. Number one, still experiencing high noise floor recording to GH5 with the Mix Pre 6. On camera, I tried to put the level at minus 12 or minus 11 dB, tried gain between 45 and 55 on the Mix Pre. I'm using an S Mic 2S from Deity. And if you could, let's go ahead and go forward to the next slide here just to give a picture of what that setup looks like. So here's Alex's setup. He's got a Mix Pre 6 there, uh, GH5 on top of it. You can see he's got a boom on a static stand there. Um, a couple of thoughts here just to make sure I understand. So I don't know when you say high noise floor, Alex, I'm not sure. Are you talking about a buzz? Are you getting a buzzing sound? And I can't tell. I can't tell from that shot if you have a quick release system between the camera and the mix pre. I can't really tell for sure. But if, if you're getting a buzzing noise, then yeah, you're probably going to want to use either a transforming a transformer isolator between the mix pre and the camera or put some sort of isolation material between the camera and the mix pre so a lot of people use a quick release system so a quick release receiver and plate that usually provides enough isolation so you're not getting a buzz now on the other hand that mic also looked a little misaimed and that could have just been the angle that i got the picture from but it looked like it was kind of off a little bit um, you'll want to kind of correct that that'll help a little bit as well or are you talking about ambient noise? Are you picking up a bunch of birds chirping and traffic noise? It looks like there's probably a road not too far away there. Um, so I really kind of need to understand that. It looks like you have the mic positioned otherwise pretty well. It's probably within, I'd say, 30 or 40 centimeters of the talent there. So that's probably good. Uh, one thing to note as well, the S-Mic 2S is a short shotgun microphone. And in fact, amongst short shotgun microphones... Uh, the deities tend to have a pretty wide polar pattern. They're not the most focused, certainly not like a Sennheiser 416 or in particular a Sanken uh, CS3E. Those are much more focused, and so you're going to definitely pick up less ambient sound that way, typically. Um, so that's another factor as well. So if you could, Alex, send over a sample, I'd like to hear it and just see if we're talking about some sort of self-noise generated in the signal chain or if we're talking about ambient sound. So that'll help narrow that down a little bit. All right, number two, is it possible to record directly from Mix Pre 6 to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K as on the GH5? What settings to use on the Pocket 4K? So yes, let me, <laughs> Alex is the one incidentally who bought the Pocket 4K that we sold a couple of weeks ago. So congratulations, Alex. Um, he's going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Um, let's see here. So Uh, yes, you definitely can use the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K's 3.5 millimeter input to take audio from the Mix Pre. All you have to do is on the on the camera, you will go into the audio menu. You will change both the left and the right inputs to get uh, line level, and then you will send the audio out. So you don't you will not have to attenuate it nearly as much as you did for the GH5, the output on the Mix Pre. Um, and if you, I think you've taken my courses, Alex. If not. Um, I do have some videos online talking about using tone to set the levels um, on the output from the Mix Pre to make sure that it's getting, you have to calibrate the levels between your camera and your Mix Pre just so that the meters are hitting the same level so you don't clip in the camera when you're doing fine on the Mix Pre. So that's the general process. So yes, you can definitely do that. All right, and then finally, I'm looking for a live video mixing software or a switch with the ability to record a few sources and ability to divide the screen so on one part I can have a presentation and on the other part I can have a person's face. Um, yes, there, uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably need some more detail, but OBS is an application that can do what you're talking about there. Uh, it's, you'll, you'll need a capture card and or switcher of some sort. Let me make a distinction here. Capture cards are what take a signal from a camera and convert it into a signal that a computer can use. Uh, a switcher allows you to take signals from multiple cameras and switch between them. It's not 
In the case of the ATEM Mini, for example, that's both a switcher and a capture card. Um, so I, I would recommend something like that, Alex. Take a look at something like that. They're fairly affordable um, for what they do. I've had really good experience with the A10 Mini series. I have the, in fact, I've got I've got one of all three of them now, <laughs> uh, because we put together a course. But they've all been really great. Um, they're quiet. They're reliable. They're uh, the functionality is impressive for the price. So that's what I would take a look at. Okay, back to Alex here, um, and then. Alex wanted to share some experience with his uh, experience with the Pocket 4K. So he's had it for a few weeks now. It's producing much better video than my GH5. I can now compare. Um, and Pocket 4K is different in a different league quality-wise. User interface is remarkable as well. Vintage Lens is producing decent results when used for video. Recommend the Takumar from Pentax and the Soviet Helios lenses. So if you're into that kind of vintage -y look, he has some recommendations for you there. So thanks very much, Alex. I appreciate the input and hopefully we got some good answers for your questions there. All right. Okay, next up we have one from, uh, this is from Jeff actually. Uh, this is not so much a question, but just uh, kind of some feedback, I guess. The past couple days had my first location sound job for a PBS production. I've done sound for my own smaller video productions for a while and musical endeavors, but this was my first time I've been hired to do just sound. It was intense. <laughs> I had a lot of the challenges from wiring shirts to wiring shirts with long, big, puffy winter coats over them. Ugh. Swinging a boom in the high wind. Walk and talk booming down a city street in a driving snowstorm. Booming acoustic guitar being played out in these locations for b-roll, head and tail slating takes, appending metadata on files, and organizing by folders all on the F8 n with Deity Wireless and boom mics. The reason I'm telling you all this was to thank you for all your training. Your light and sound training has been immensely helpful to me. I learned a lot about dancing with a camera person, writing my levels, boom handling noise, lav noise, and editing my takes on the F8N to be able to hand off neat, organized, informative audio files with sound reports. Just so you know, your training is helping people do new things and do well. Thank you. So that's great feedback. So thanks so much, Jeff. And um, for those of for others of you that have done your first jobs or you know having new experiences, definitely. Go ahead and submit those as well. We'd love to hear from each of you and kind of the lessons you've learned. So Jeff, Jeff had, um, actually we talked about one of Jeff's songs a few weeks ago um, for those of you that were there for that session and now he's doing some location sounds. So great job, Jeff. Yeah, those are all the practical issues <laughs> that you are sure to run into when you're doing location sound work. So um, lots of good stuff there. All right, let's go back to the chat here for some questions. First off from Rolf, what's the best way to make dialogue sound reliably good on mobile devices such as tablets and smartphones in addition to all other speakers? Any advice on EQ and compressor in that regard? I, would, um, I wouldn't I uh, would approach it quite that way. So what I would do is I would use whatever reference monitors or headphones you're using as your reference. I wouldn't specifically target a mix for mobile devices. And the reason I say that is that if you get the mix sounding right, it's not going to it's going to sound as best as can be expected on mobile devices and you know with headphones or earbuds or whatever so that would be my thought um, i wouldn't specifically do anything to kind of target the the audio for mobile devices hope that makes sense um, the, the thing is is that when people watch things on mobile devices they're used to how that mobile device sounds so i don't know that you'd want to kind of go around that and also if the audience happens to not be listening on a mobile device then you'd have this mix that's optimized for a mobile device and would sound really weird on other devices so anyway some thoughts there it's a good question Rolf and it's a tough one that we all struggle with but what I would do is use you know whatever reference monitors you have or headphones you have um, and I would advise to not just use headphones if you can avoid it but they're good I mean headphones are good and it's good to to reference on them in addition to proper monitors but then also go play it on a mobile device and see how it translates so uh thomas is requesting i love a video walking through your planning prepping loading in shooting wrapping one of your corporate videos i actually did a piece uh, a sound for video session last uh about 18 months ago now i did uh, i did a location job for um the show that used to be called american chopper <laughs> if any of you've ever seen that before um, and I talked about, I, I showed all of the things that I 
loaded in for that. That was a sound job. Now you're talking about corporate videos, so that that's a good a good request. And when we get back to doing in person corporate videos, that's definitely something I'll put on the list to to do. So thanks for that. All right, we're scouring here. What lighting do you use on site? Um, mostly Lupo lights. Uh, they're for corporate talking head interviews and stuff like that. Those are the most convenient for me because they're all one piece. I don't have to have another. I you know we can put a softbox on them, but I typically don't need it because I can move it in really close and it's plenty soft for a face. Um, I'm using the 60s mainly. Um, I can get away with a 30 as well. It's not quite as soft as the 60, but the 30, the, the 60s are bigger. They're they're kind of this big, but they're just a lot easier to work with. Now, I really love the aperture lights as well, but setting up and breaking down those soft boxes, you need a lot more room to set those up as well. And a lot of times when I'm working in these really small conference rooms or offices, there's just not enough room for those. And so that's why a lot of times I'm using those Lupo lights instead. So they're panel, LED panels, just if, for those that aren't familiar with them. All right, are you forced to use the loading dock with your rigs? No, thankfully. <laughs> in my particular case, I don't. Um, in some in some venues, I'm sure you would be. In my case, I don't. Um, the The loading dock is, it's just in the way this building that I work at is laid out. It just doesn't work well. It's, it's two stories below where I need to be. There is an elevator, um, but it's actually, to be honest, it's easier. I can get a pass to get in one of the front parking spots and I can unload everything there and get everything in on my carts, the, the rock and roller and the sound cart in basically one shot. So <clears throat> it's just as easy for me to do that at this point. But that's a fair question. It really depends on the venue. In some cases, you may have to do that. All right. Angelo Jack has a question. Uh, do you have recommendations for a robust wireless system that can be used worldwide? Do a lot of work in a remote African countries. Okay, so this is a challenging one. Um, let me tell you why it's challenging. So, how are we on time? Oh, we've got a few minutes. We're good. Okay. Um, it's a challenging question for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't know in those African countries what frequencies are allowed as far as wireless microphone systems are concerned. And I imagine if they're... Um, remote enough, nobody's going to care, but <laughs> I'm not proposing to break any laws. So I think the first thing you need to find out is for those particular African countries, what wireless frequencies are available. Usually their government website with um, or their equivalent of the Federal Communication Commission, that's what it is here in the United States, but whatever the equivalent is in those African countries, you're going to want to look at those. Um, they may not have it posted on a website. You may have to call somebody to find the information that you need. Or if you can find anyone else who's worked in those countries, find out what they've used. That's one option. Number two, and that's going to be the more robust UHF transmitting wireless systems. Now, you can go with a 2.4 gigahertz system, but I wouldn't necessarily call those robust. Um, the nice thing about a 2.4 gigahertz system, like, for example, the Roadlink is one example, is that you can use it pretty much in any country. It's using a frequency that's available in any country because it's the same frequency that's used for Wi-Fi. And I don't know of a country where you can't use that for wireless microphones as well. So it's it's essentially um, wide open. Roadlink, I've had a pretty good experience with it. It's been pretty robust and held up well. And I don't know what kind of things you're shooting, but if I had to choose one and I couldn't track down any information and I didn't necessarily have the budget for, you know, something like a um, Audio Limited, Le Electrosonics, Wizzycom. I mean, these are all, as soon as you get more than, you know, a one-channel system is going to cost you multiple thousands of dollars in short. A Roadlink kit will cost you $400. So um, it really kind of depends on your budget. Now, with the Roadlink, if you're working in and mostly doing interviews, that's going to be just fine in most cases. Um, so that may be a perfectly legitimate for what you're trying to do. Um, I'm still, you know, of all the 2.4 gigahertz systems, I keep kind of coming back to that one. It's just really reliable. I still own mine. I still keep them around. And if I have to, you know, if I'm in a pinch and I'm going to do a freelance job and I need to have one more channel, I usually won't hesitate to use one of those road links and they usually hold up really quite well. So I've never had a bad, bad experience in a production setting. And again, mostly doing interviews or walk and talks and stuff like that. So pretty straightforward. Hopefully that helps. 
and good luck and exciting for you to go to Africa to do some shooting. That's cool. Um, there are several ways to export dialogue, music, and effects from Final Cut Pro 10 to Audition. What method do you use? Render, XML, Resolve, X to CC. I actually use X to CC, so I'll export the XML file and then use X to CC to convert that. It's typically how I'm doing it. Um, and I've had a pretty good experience with that. So um, you could just render the whole thing out. Um, I like the XML. It does... Actually, I don't know. You know, to be honest, I haven't rendered it out, and I don't know. So if you render out a, I assume, a ProRes master, I assume it keeps... I don't know how many channels of audio that keeps. And so I think if, you know, when I'm working, for example, on a short film, a lot of them will have, you know, like the original audio design, Will the, the editor will have put... Oh, gosh. I've had as many as... Even in the original cut, I'll have like 30 tracks of audio. So I don't know what, I think the ProRes format has a limit to the number of tracks it can support. So that may be a little limit, limitation there. That's why I use the XML and the X to CC approach. So that's just my experience so far. JHB, what are a good pair of reference speakers to start with? Um, JBL has a, peer, a set of them called the Series 1. I think they're the 103s. Um, the first set that I had were really good. They were wired. And um, they, they released a new version with Bluetooth. I'd stay away from Bluetooth. I think that the Bluetooth version you can also hardwire. If you hardwire those, those actually sounded surprisingly good to me. And it felt like I was getting most of the frequencies without any super massive coloration. Another company to look at um, as far as starter reference monitors, um, what's the name of it? It starts with a K, Cali, I think it is. It's a bunch of um, engineers that left JBL <laughs> and went and started, I think, they I th was it JBL or Mackie they left? They left one of the two of them and went off and started their own company. So the Cali monitors are definitely worth looking at as well. All right. Is that everything? My director says I got all the questions. Really? Okay. Well, <laughs> where are we at on time? We have three minutes, people. If you have a question, go ahead and get it in really quickly here. We'll be happy to address that. Um, Michael, it's good to have you here. Um Michael, maybe you can give us an update on the, some people were asking about the wireless course. And I know you've had some work show up. So if you want to kind of give an update, my, my sense is that we're probably looking at a release date closer to, you know, if we're, if we're lucky and the, the time scheduling gods smile upon us, we're looking by the end of the year, maybe. Um, it, may, it may leak over or may slip over into the start of next year. But um, the good news is that Michael is, back to work it's looking like so <laughs> um all right i think that's all we've got for today so everybody i wanted to say thanks so much for the questions that were submitted ahead of time and for those in the chat here thanks for everyone's participation for joining us here get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to you again next week take care everybody <laughs>